Hello, it's Davey Mooney coming to you from the University of North Texas where I run the jazz guitar program. I'm a Benedetto artist, Sunnyside Records artist. I got five Sunnyside Records, records, CDs really, and including Wayback, uh, the newest one. I like this one, it's my favorite. I uh, also got two Mel Bay books, Into the Labyrinth, Personalizing Jazz Vocabulary. And uh, yeah, let's see, it's late February here at uh, UNT, the spring 2024 semester is in full uh, career. It's running. And uh, I just got back from uh, Buffalo, New York, where I was at my kids' uh, hockey tournament, Go Texas Tigers. I uh, made it all the way to the semifinals, lost in overtime. Played two outdoor games in Buffalo, and I gotta say, it's a little chilly up there this time of year. Um, I had a great time, ate some chicken wings. Uh, it was a you know trip to the north, so to speak. And uh, yeah, I'm actually doing something uh, unprecedented uh, for this video. I'm gonna revisit a tune that I, I did a video on maybe like a year and a half, two years ago. And uh, it's Wayne Shorter's Anna Maria. And I feel like it's warranted because since I did that last video, this song has uh, earned a spot in the uh, advanced jazz improv uh, syllabus every semester here at UNT um, and I feel like I've gotten a lot better playing on it in the interim and hopefully better at teaching it. I've kind of uh, delved more into some uh, other versions of it, uh, other recordings and yeah I just feel like I have, uh, I can play better on it and talk better on it etc. So yeah man what a, what a great song, one of Wayne Shorter's best tunes, I think. Might even be in my favorite Wayne Shorter song. Um, and I have a lot of history with this tune, going way back to uh, the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts in the 1990s. I tell the students here when we play it that I've been playing this song for, uh, this will be, I think, my 27th or 28th year <laughs> playing it, which is crazy, because I remember uh, playing it in like 1996 in performance class and somehow kind of scuffling my way way through the tune. Um, and yeah, since then, it's, it keeps coming back, you know. Like I remember Terrence Blanchard in the Monk Institute gave Anna Maria, like one of the first days we, we saw him at the beginning of that program, he gave Anna Maria as an example of the type of compositions he wanted us to write, the way the melody, you know, develops um, over the course of the song. And uh, yeah. Whew. What a great song. So uh, originally on Native Dancer, 1975 record with Milton Nascimento and Herbie. That whole album, I think, is like a big influence on uh, jazz history. And, you know, music, popular music history, that fusion of uh, Brazilian and American jazz styles that started, gosh, it, possibly earlier, but at least by, you know, uh, the Bossa Nova, Tom Jobim, João Gilberto with Stan Getz and all that. Um, this is a different kind of Brazilian music, you know, more uh, Minas Gerais and Milton Nascimento. Um, but man, it's such a really cool blend of, of musics, a fusion. Uh, big influence, I think, on Matheny's music, Wayne Shorter, obviously, and Weather Report, and, you know, lots of other, my music, lots of people. So, um, and then there's a, another, it's been recorded a few times. Uh, the initial recording, they don't solo on the, the form. They just kind of play the melody twice and then solo on the vamp. And then in the 90s, God, what year is this record? It's probably around 94, 95. Uh, Kenny Kirkland's album, uh, I think the only album he did as a leader, where he does a piano trio version of it with uh, some percussion too. And he takes like three or four choruses. And really, uh, it's like the perfect combination of jazz vocabulary and also a real, uh, like, paying attention to all the modal implications of all the chords. Because the reason this song has earned a place in my uh, improv class every semester is I feel like it really illustrates, probably better than any other song in the repertoire, the importance of understanding uh, modes and sort of jazz school harmony to a certain extent. Um, but also the importance of jazz vocabulary. And you know, you need to know the modal 
not just modes as expressed by seven note scales, but the sounds, the very specific sounds that he uh, composes on this song. But you also have to know how to play, for lack of a better term, jazz <laughs> over the chords. And you know, you think the whole song's gonna be modal, and then all of a sudden there's a part where it's like, well, what is that? Um, which is kind of how I feel about Wayne Shorter's music in general. You're, you're going along good, and then <laughs> he hits you with something, and you're like, wait, what? Like Fee Fi Fo Fong, where you think it's just like bluesy grooving, and then he hits you with like. <laughs> you're like, no, what happened? Um, so anyway, yeah, there's Kenny Kirkland's version in the 90s, and also a really great version that's related to my, uh, you know, up upbringing at, at New Orleans Center for Creative Arts. There's an Adonis Rose album, great drummer and uh, a New Orleans musician. Uh, his album, The Unity, on Criss Cross Records from, I don't know what year, 96, 95, something like that. It's basically a Nicholas Payton's working band of the 90s. Uh, Ruben Rogers, Tim Warfield, Anthony Wanzi, Nicholas, and uh, Adonis, and they play the song on there. And I tell my students, I think that the one chorus solo that uh, Nicholas Payton plays, it might be on flugelhorn, I'm not sure, but it might be the perfect, <laughs> the perfect chorus on Anna Maria, possibly like, just in general. It's just, everything is just, hmm. And if you want to find this recording, it's actually spelled a little differently. It's on Apple Music. It's Anna Maria, but A-N-N-A. -N -N -A. You can look up Adonis Rose, Anna Maria, and I encourage you, it's a really great version. So all that being said, let's, let's look at the song. So, uh, starts off with this kind of G Phrygian vamp, sort of, I think it's maybe the same number of times every, every time, and it goes from G Phrygian to kind of like an E flat major over G. It's almost like G Phrygian to G Aeolian. Honestly, when I play on that, I kind of just play like bluesy. There's also Kurt Rosenwinkel's version on uh, Reflections where he goes... He just goes from a, <laughs> like an open G power chord almost to like E flat and A flat. Kenny Kirkland, although, he uh, adds another harmony to that. So he goes like G Phrygian to sort of, uh, what do you call it? E flat over G. And then he goes to this sound, which is like a, a melodic minor kind of sound. It's like an A flat major seven sharp five. So there's an E natural in there. So it's like the second mode of F melodic minor. And he kind of plays over that a little bit uh, in the intro. And whenever it comes up, he has that extra chord in there because the song definitely didn't have enough chords. He had to put another one in there. But, uh, and uh, Adonis's version, I think, is pretty close to the uh, original harmonically. And so it starts out, you get all over a G bass note, you get like, G Ionian, G major 7 is the first chord, and then it goes right to E flat major 7 over G. Then kind of F major over G, or G7 sus, back to E flat major 7 over G. So those first four bars you got all over a, a modal mixture, all over a G pedal of G Ionian. Play a G major scale or some kind of some kind of sound that involves a major seven, possibly a, a C natural. You don't really have to even play a C. And often when I play on this song, I'll play like either pentatonics or the thing where I <laughs> I make it sound jazzy. I play chromaticism, you know, as if it were a G major seven and I don't know a standard tune being played by somebody in the fifties. Um, but that you had major seven to Aeolian, G Aeolian, so a minor with a sharp five or flat six to a mixolydian, so it's kind of like G major, G minor, G dominant sound, G minor, just in the first four bars, and then a D flat over F, D flat major over F, or I sometimes call this like D flat two over F, Don, Donald Fagan chord. G flat major seven sharp eleven. Uh, smelly. To A flat minor seven. To B flat over A flat. So we're uh, <laughs> we're eight bars in, and we've 
going a lot of places harmonically and modally. So this is like, to me, it's D flat major, just over the third. I mean, I guess you could call it F Phrygian, but to me, Phrygian has a particular sound. Like this would be Phrygian, even though, even though the notes are the same that you would play over it. That to me is a very different sound than this. I don't know. So I think of that as just it's a D flat major. Just happens to have the third in the bass. Uh, the G flat Lydian, which is the same scale, right? So you get the same scale for two two bars, and you think you're okay, and then <laughs> doesn't last long. Then, a flat Dorian, so that's play some A flat minor jazz stuff over it. But you know, if you want to think about a scale, G flat major starting on A flat, A flat Dorian, and then this chord, kind of your your Aguas Aguas Marso chord. Uh, and uh, that song would have actually been kind of new when they recorded this, right? I don't know when Tanja Beam wrote that, but anyway. Uh, but in this case, I think that that sound, yeah, you could play off of those triads. You know, I have this weird thing with the triad pair, like an A-flat and B-flat triad, I always hear. I always hear the heat is on if I try to do the triad pair. And uh, I don't know if Beverly Hills Cop and, and this song are, should mix very well. But anyway, that's like a weird issue that I have, but I kind of hear that sound, even though it doesn't specify what kind of 7 uh, against the A-flat bass note, I hear it as like kind of A-flat Lydian dominant because the next chord is G minor, or maybe because the chord before it has a G-flat, so if you think of it as a A-flat dominant 7, sharp 11, E flat melodic minor, it becomes like five of the next chord, which is G minor. To C7 sus. To D over C to C7 sus. So here we go again, but G minor, you know, G Dorian. C7 sus. Same thing, right? F major tonality, play some jazz stuff on it. And again, to me, that that D tried over C is kind of C7, C dominant, kind of G melodic minor, or some kind of expression of that sound, augmented. Play a D augmented triad, something like that. D major triad plus B flat. I don't know, there's a million things you could play. Um, and then, then an A flat major seven, kind of sharp eleven over C. Uh, so you have another little modal mixture there, like C seven sus or B flat triad over C, D triad over C, and then A flat triad over C. So another sort of modal mixture, maybe reference to the the first four bars. And that, to me, again, it could, I guess you could call it. I mean, to me, it's sort of an A flat major seven sharp eleven with a third in the bass. Um, e flat, the E flat major scale. Yeah, E flat major scale. You know, and this is something I talk about in this book here. You know, um, to a certain extent, when I play over these sounds now and these chords, I mean, at one point I learned the major scales, and you know, I did the cage system and all that, and I know where the notes are, but. It's more like at this point, when I see that sound, I see that sound, I see that shape, that chord in that part of the neck, I have very specific shapes that I use to improvise over it. And if you're interested more in that, this book goes into it in a lot of detail. It's got like <laughs> over 100 pages of chord diagrams and crazy stuff. Um, and that's the first A section we just talked about. <laughs> so this might be a long video. Uh, and then he goes back to the, the vamp, although it's not a vamp, I think it's just four bars. G Phrygian to G Aeolian, or this sound to this sound, kind of. And honestly, when I go there, a lot of the time, I'll play like blues, G blues, G minor blues, um, because I've just been dealing with a lot of harmony, and I want to like cleanse the palate a little bit. Although Kenny, you know, Other chord there. 
Uh, so that's the A section. This song's kind of like three tunes in one, at least. So the second section, and that was one of the things I think Terrence really liked about the way he, the melody develops in a logical way, but not in a like overly literal or didactic kind of way. It's sort of like what, what Schoenberg uh, called developing variation when he was uh, analyzing or thinking about uh, Brahms' music. This, this melody, you know. And then the second A starts, major seven, right to the sus. So when trying to memorize this song, it's really difficult because you know, the first time it's major, minor, sus, minor. And the second time, the B section, it's major, sus. And then you got a very interesting kind of jazz vocabulary part of the song where you have uh, basically an F7 sus to an E7 sharp 9 to an E flat 7 sus. Reminds me of Donald Fagan again. Uh, I don't know which came first. But maybe they got it at the same time. Maybe it all came from somebody else I'm not even thinking about. But uh, so when I try to teach students what to play over this part, one of the things I, I talk about is the fact that these three chords F7 sus, E7 uh, sharp 9, E flat 7 sus have some notes in common. They have these five notes. Sometimes it's cool like to when the changes are moving around so much if you can find something that will maybe simplify a little bit um, that can be a nice gesture or uh, <laughs> approach so so those notes five notes stay the same and against that you can kind of play off the fact that this moves you know uh, the roots go down chromatically and so do the sevenths of each chord, so. That's one approach. And sometimes I tell them too, you know, uh, thinking of just a jazzy thing like, I don't know, say McCoy Tyner were playing this tune, he might go. You could kind of just play uh, that one, two, three, five thing. Uh, scale degrees going down. Doesn't agree totally with E7 sharp 9, but I feel like sometimes, depending on where you're coming from and where you're going, that can work too. Because it's such a strong jazz vocabulary uh, gesture that it doesn't even have to 100% agree with the harmony. So, and after E flat 7 sus, you got D major. F7 sharp 5 to B flat minor to A flat minor 7 to B flat over A flat again. And this part here, I like to play off of uh, this is one of the few real strong 5 1 progressions you have in the song, but it's interesting, like D major to F7 sharp 5 to B flat minor 9. And so if you think about a D major 7 arpeggio, think about an F augmented arpeggio, they actually have a lot in common, I mean, a couple notes in common. They have a A and C sharp, right? So sometimes I'll play off of D major 7 arpeggio to F augmented arpeggio, and then resolve that to a B flat minor. The other day I was, I was taking a student through like each chunk of the neck, the sort of voice leading of that, that here's D major 7, Here's F augmented, and then here's B flat minor. And there's a real strong kind of voice leading thing going on there in every little chunk of the neck. Um, it's so beautiful too. That's actually the I think that's the one part of the song that actually repeats literally in the C section. He has the same. So some of this we've had already. You know, you get to B flat minor, B flat Dorian. Flat minor to B flat over A flat again. That can be Lydian dominant. Then you go we got G minor again to C7. Oh wait. I 
get the melody mixed up. That's the melody the last time. So <laughs> this time you get G minor, C7, and then you get this B flat major, A minor, F minor thing. And so for a while you're interested in F major key center, which is kind of nice. Sort of a 2 5 and F, but then it goes to the 4, the 3, but then it goes F minor. So for at least a few bars. some parallel parallelism in the chords here so you have F minor and then really the climax of the tune of the form is this part right here where you have a series of uh, sus chords so you have B flat 7 sus which is actually the same as F minor right if you think of F minor F Dorian put B flat in the bass it's really the same sound and then you go up a minor third and you have a D flat 7 sus which is really you know, A flat minor A flat Dorian D flat mixed basically can go up another minor third and the C section starts with a B minor 9 then you go up a major third from there to E flat minor 9 so all of that to me is kind of the same same harmony sometimes with the as a sus chord sometimes as a minor 7 chord so that's not that bad <laughs> if you can remember all of it and you know like I said I've been teaching it a lot in the last year and a half so I feel it's kind of, you know, embedded itself in my, my long-term memory or whatever term memory I'm dealing with at this point. Um, then you have the repetition I talked about. You have D major 7, F7 sharp 5, B flat minor 9, A flat minor 7, B flat over A flat. And then this part, you think it's going to repeat, this part's going to repeat again. This time it goes B flat major, A minor, F minor, you're like, oh, it's going to be the same. And then this is the chord that always, like, messes me up. There's, like, an E minor 7. And then it goes back to that bad part. So sometimes that E minor 7, I, like, play too much on it. You know, I think, like, you can just play, kind of ignore it if you want, or just, just don't play too many notes, and don't try to think about it as a scale. It's just a passing, you know, it's a... Uh, passing fancy, you know, I don't know. Sometimes, all I know is that I just, sometimes I'll, it comes up in the course of my solo and I play too much on it. I like take it too seriously. I feel like it, it just needs, it needs to almost be like part of the G minor, G sound that it's going to, which it's kind of a G major sound, right? And then you go back to your Phrygian. So anyway, man, that's the whole song, y'all. Um, really uh, brilliant and beautiful, mysterious. Um, I don't know, but it's it's earned its place in the for me as like in a curriculum or a pedagogy that uh, in which it's really important to understand. Because I don't know how you would improvise on that framework if you didn't understand like different modalities. Whether you wanted to think of them as major scales or seven note scales or if you think that that's too jazz school for you you know you still have to be able to identify those sounds and improvise over them and both Kenny Kirkland and Nicholas Payton do that and other people but those are the versions that I've really like kind of settled on as, as canonical along with Wayne's version but he doesn't solo on the form and to show students the importance of both of those uh, you know, to understand, you need vocabulary. That's kind of what my books are about, too. You need vocabulary, but you also need to know the right notes to get into the right key centers. And Anna Maria is a crash course, uh, more than a crash course. It's like an advanced uh, graduate school course in that approach. So I'm going to play one chorus. I'll try to get the perfect chorus. I don't know if I'm going to get it, y'all. I think Nicholas already played it back in the 90s. But one chorus and, and try to play vocab. Be, be in the right key areas and also hopefully say something musically. So, hope you dig it. Anna Maria, revisit. 